Namaste. My name is Anjali Damerla and I'm from Los Angeles, California. My topic today is going to be conflict management and resolution by women in Vedic period. First, let's start with an overview of our current situation. As of April 2024, there are 10 major ongoing conflicts globally. Back in 2022, approximately 614 million women and girls lived in conflict-affected countries. And now with the recent issues in Middle East countries, this number definitely is increased. But despite significant impacts on women, they are largely excluded from peace negotiations. And data from 2022 shows that women constituted only 16% of negotiators in the UN-led or co-led peace processes. But on the other hand, evidence shows that during Vedic era, women held significant influence and actively participated in political decision-making, negotiations, and conflict resolution at the family, community, and national levels. By utilizing Vedic Grantha and Shastra, this presentation will try to understand the contributions of women during the Vedic period to conflict management and resolution. We will also discuss the necessary societal and national transformations required today to empower women and elevate their prominence. So how did Vedic Shastras deal with conflict management and resolution? Did everyone use their own strategy? Was there any particular method that was followed? The Vedic texts describe detailed and systematic approaches for managing and resolving conflicts. They highlight four main strategies called Upaya for achieving resolution. Sama, Dana, Bheda, and Danda. Sama, which is always the very first option, is peaceful negotiation. If Sama doesn't work, then move on to Dana, which is offering gifts. If Sama and Dana don't work, then move on to Bheda, which is create division or discord. And as a last option, use Danda, which is punishment, force, or going to war. Matsya Purana also mentions two more options, Maya and Indrajal. These upayas were followed in this particular order and were taught, taught in Gurukulas. We see a mention of these upayas in Matsya Purana and Agni Purana both. But we see, interestingly, the practical application of these upayas in Valmiki Ramayana by Hanuman himself. In Sundarkanda, it is narrated that after meeting Sita Mata, Hanuman contemplated what his next step should be. His objective was to gather more intelligence on Ravana and his ministers, particularly wanted to understand their plans and strength. So Hanuman considered the four strategies for success. Na sama rakshahasu gunaya kalpate, na dhanam artha upachite shuvartate, na bhed sadhya baladarpita janaha parakramahatu esha mama iha rochate. Sama is not going to work on Rakshasas because peace, peaceful negotiations is not their nature. Dana will not work either because Lanka is very rich. They have all the wealth. Bheda will not work either because all Rakshasas are equally strong. So showing my parakrama, showing my strength is going to be the best option is what Hanuman decides. So what was the status of women during Vedic period? Did they actually participate in any conflict resolutions? Are there any documented examples that we can find? Let's see. Let's start with looking at status of women in Vedic period. To understand the status of women in Vedic period, we must understand the concept of Ardha Nari Nareshwar, which is unique to Sanatan Dharma. Ardha Nari Nareshwar symbolizes the synthesis of masculine and feminine energies of the universe, known as Purusha and Prakriti. It illustrates how Shakti is inseparable from Shiva. And with such a profound concept at its core, women during Vedic period enjoyed an elevated status in family and in society. They were involved in many aspects of the society, including academics, philosophy, government, and even military. So let's see if we can find some examples of women warriors in Vedic period. We have Vishpala first. The warrior queen who is mentioned in the hymns of the Gveda. She was known for her bravery. Vishpala is notable for receiving a prosthetic leg made of iron after losing her leg in a battle. Then we have Satyabhama, the warrior wife of Sri Krishna, who fought alongside Sri Krishna in the battle to defeat Narkasura. And then, of course, we have Kaikai, the very famous third queen of Dasharatha, who fought alongside Dasharatha in a war against the Asuras 
and also saved Dashrata when he was seriously injured. We have some very good examples of women from Vedic period that were influential leaders. We have Satyavati, mother of sage Vyasa, who played a significant role in Mahabharata. We have Kunti, mother of Pandavas. She was a very strong and influential leader. She had considerable influence in the political and social dynamics. And then, of course, we have Gandhari, wife of Dhritarashtra, mother of Kauravas. She too had very considerable influence on the, with the Kaurava dynasty. And she was a key figure in making a lot of political decisions. We see that in Vedic period, we also had many inf women influential thinkers. There were more than 25 Rishikas that were mentioned, that are mentioned in Vedas. To name a few, it's Lopamudra, Gargi, Maitreyi, Romasa, Appala, Kadru, Ghosha, and many more. Rishikas were Vedic scholars who participated regularly in scholarly debates. They were also responsible for educating and training female students that came to Gurukulas. Let's now look at some very uh, examples where we see women uh, in the, from Vedic time using upayas for conflict resolution. First, we have Mohini Avatar, Bhagwan Vishnu's only female avatar who appears during Samudra Manthan incident. So in order to make sure that Amruta doesn't fall in the evil hands of Rakshasa, Mohini uses a combination of two upayas. She uses both Sama and Maya to achieve the desired result. She uses Sama Upaya and convinces Rakshasas to let her be the responsible candidate to distribute the Amruta to everybody. And once she convinces Rakshasas, she uses Maya to trick Rakshasas and give all the Amrut to Devas only, thus averting the danger of Rakshasas becoming immortal. We then have another example of Kanthari, Queen Gandhari, wife of Dhritarashtra. During Draupadi Vastaharan incident, Gandhari realized that Draupadi was going to curse the entire Kuru dynasty. That was going to be devastating for the dynasty. So she took shelter of two upayas to avert a crisis on Kuru dynasty. She uses Sama to convince Dhritarashtra that a curse from Draupadi would be devastating for the dynasty. And she also convinces Dhritarashtra to use Dana to give Draupadi three boons to pacify her anger. We also have a very good example of Tara, an extolled, who was extolled as one of the Panchakanyas. She was known for her conviction and intelligence. In the Kishkinda Kand of Ramayana, Lakshmana was sent to remind Sugriva of his vow to help Sri Rama in their search of Sita. Lakshmana was very angry and he was he had an intention to destroy the entire Kishkinda. It was Tara who faced Lakshmana bravely and pacified him. She used the Sama Upaya to calm him down and averted a crisis. Note that Sugriva sent Tara and not any of his other ministers to talk to Lakshmana. If not for Tara's diplomacy, Ramayana might have had a very different ending, I think. So what insights can we gain from these women of Vedic period? Nothing is impossible for women to do, is what they tell us. They can be in every field that they think of, including politics and military. What are the changes that are necessary to effectively involve women today in conflict management? In my opinion, women need to in three fields, academia, military, and government. Why academia? Because academia essentially shapes the strategies that are used for resolving disputes. They are the scholars that analyze historical data and come up with successful strategies. They advise governments and international organizations on conflict management. Women need to get into military because military is involved in both prevention and resolution of conflicts. Military is responsible for containing conflicts within defined areas. Women also need to get into government because government creates policies, enforces laws, and they prevent and resolve conflicts. They implement measures to, uh, uh, to promote economic development, and they also collaborate with international organizations and neighboring countries to manage and resolve conflicts that have cross-border implications. So now that we have seen what is to be done, let's see how to bring that necessary societal and national transformation. We need to do it at three levels, at the level of family, level of society, and at level of the government. At the family level, we need to ensure that the women of the family are respected and are given equal opportunity. We need to encourage women to participate in family decisions 
including financial decisions and conflict management decisions. And we also need to develop and train our young girls, our young daughters of our family to handle various conflict situations. At the society level, we need to again ensure that in the society, women are respected, get equal opportunities. And we need to encourage women to participate in social welfare causes, develop their leadership skills, and give them a platform to lead locally. At the government level, at the national level, we need to ensure that women are able to participate safely, equally, and freely in national politics. We must include more women in government cabinets and various top positions. As con my concluding remarks, I would like to emphasize that we need to reduce the underrepresentation of women. And for that, we must encourage and include women at every level in our society and governments, especially in conflict resolution policies and teams. I would like to particularly emphasize the important role India has to play. India has a great Vedic foundation and a rich history of women and leader, women leaders and warriors. With a female population exceeding 600 million in India, we have a crucial role in leading the way and empowering women. Indian women have a great opportunity to become a role model for the rest of the world. I would like to conclude my presentation with the Devi Mahatma Mantra. Atulam tatra tatte jaha sarva desha shari rajam ekastham tat bhum nari vyapta loka trayam tvisha. The incomparable radiance that was born from all gods and pervaded the three worlds came to one place and that took form of a woman. Thank you.